Okay, so I just wanted to go over a uh, method to tramming your spindle. You know, if you don't want to spend a hundred bucks on one of the tramming gauges. This is a method that I've thought about uh, for tramming this spindle, and I haven't seen anybody else do this, but I'm sure there has to be somebody else that's thought about this. Anyway, I put my biggest cutter uh, into my spindle, and I come over to a fresh spot on the bed, and basically what I do is lower this down until it's just grazing the surface and I just spin it by hand. So I'll just sort of show you here. And once I get close I just use the uh, the hand wheel and get it down. So it's just above the surface. Um, I have the MPG in uh, times 10 mode on the Z-axis. I found that to actually be most, most accurate for, and I just go down one click. And you see it's grazing the surface there. So I do a couple rotations like that just to make sure it's clear uh, because we don't know if this plate is flat enough. I mean with a 10 millimeter end mill. If I had a 12 millimeter, um, you know, the full half inch, I would do it with that, but this is what I have right now. Um, I go down one more click and it should be a little tougher to turn and we should be taking out a chip and that should be pretty level. If you're trimmed um, um, front to back and left to right, that cutter should make an even, even cut all the way around. That's the purpose of only going down that one notch. So when I started, uh, like it would be very light on this side and it would be, you know, a full cut on this side. Um, but as we see now, uh, pretty even all the way around. So that'll get you most of the way there. Then from there, I recommend doing some vertical and horizontal uh, facing operations. Your vertical one will tell you um, if you're okay in the left and right direction, uh, your lengthwise, milling operation will tell you if you're okay in your front to back. Um, and whichever side of the cut you can feel a little bit of a deviation on, not even a ridge, you want to get it down so that there's like none of that sort of waviness to the surface. Um, you know, if it were on this side of, of the cut, uh, you would know that you're out. Um, you're tilted too far this way, you'd need to go back some. Um, if it were on the opposite side of the cut, you would know you're leaned the opposite way. And same with your, your vertical. Um, if your ridge is on this side, you would know that, you know, you need to bring it down on this side. Uh, you'd need to twist everything that way a little bit. If it were on the opposite side, you'd need to twist it the other way. So um, these are the last cuts that I did, and it's perfectly smooth. Uh, in both directions. So that's about as good as you can hope for. Now having a dial gauge set, yeah, you could dial it in even more, but uh, for most of the stuff that most of us are going to be doing, I, like, I can't feel any deviation in that at all. It's perfect. Um, so we'll see as we go along. Things may need to be adjusted. Um, only thing I had to shim was right up top here. Uh, I needed a couple shims there because uh, front to back, it was uh, a little bit, a little bit out. Um, other than that, I had uh, had to twist this uh, 0 0.05 of a degree, and actually my uh, digital level box is pretty darn close. Uh, I put it to exactly 90 degrees so that it would want to skew um, just slightly back towards 89.95 uh, in this direction, and that seemed to be perfect. So, 
digital box is out just slightly, but you know, if you play with it, and other than that, I haven't done any adjustments since I built this. All of my adjustment time was spent during the build process, so there you go. I won't claim that this method is perfect, but seemed to work out quite well. I've got an extremely flat surface, and when I surfaced, the, surfaced this, uh, I ended up doing a five millimeter step over, which is half the diameter of that uh, that that mill, and it does a really nice job of just like, keeping things really consistently smooth. Because even if you are out just a little tiny bit, only doing the five millimeter step over sort of helps correct for that. You can sort of ensure that you're going to get a flat surface because you're using half the mill if the other half is out just slightly um, doesn't really matter as much so okay so final overall thoughts of the DMC2 and its assembly I think this machine is a heck of a value for the money uh, there's no way that you could put this machine together yourself all the little bits and parts without spending a ton more time and a ton more money um, yeah, I'd say that 40 hours is probably about accurate for the assembly of the machine. Um, it took me a bit extra time to do the wiring because I wired up my own power supply box, uh, and I did a few things a little bit differently with certain aspects of the assembly just to suit my, uh, my setup here. But overall, I have to say, um, incredible value and... To all the people who, you know, have given this machine hate online, uh, I think it's unwarranted because, yeah, there are issues, some issues to work through, but they're no different than any issues I've had with any other CNC uh, style process that I've used, whether it's plasma, mill, router, um, anything like that. It just all, you, there's always going to be problems that you have to work work through and this is not a paint by numbers kit this gives you all of the parts and a guide for assembly you have to use your own brain and your own troubleshooting and your own um, sort of process for dialing everything in and dealing with those issues uh, if you're not somebody that's mechanically inclined or you've never done anything with CNC I wouldn't recommend getting this kit I don't think that's who this is aimed towards um, if you're brand new to this you'd be much better off buying one of the cheaper CNC routers or something like that, doing some stuff with that, learning the mindset and the troubleshooting process that you can go through, figure out what parameters control what. Um, you're going to be very limited with what you can do with those machines, but it's also a much smaller investment. And then you'll know if you're the type of person that, uh, you know, CNC milling is for you or not. And then you can maybe decide to uh, take the plunge into something that is a little bit more of an investment, like the DMC2, but also has a ton more capability. 
And trust me, you're way better off making mistakes on a smaller Chinese CNC when you're just trying to cut wood or aluminum than you are on something like the DMC2 and, uh, you know, hitting some steel the wrong way. You saw the first cuts that I did there in that little video. That was just from the setup that I did and alignment that I did as I was assembling the machine, nothing else. And if I can get those type of results without expensive, expensive gauges and dials and tools and a bunch of fooling around, um, well, it's a bit of fooling around. It, it takes a little bit of time, but you know, you just be patient, you work things back and forth and you get there. Um, so now I'm getting really great cut results and uh, just the final couple panels to put on and uh, that's it. So hopefully that helps some of you out there. I think this kit is an incredible value. I don't understand all the haters online who, I don't know whether they thought this would be a paint by numbers machine or they're not very mechanically inclined or what's going on. There's a few issues to work through. The manual is definitely not perfect, but it's enough of a guide that you can get you going in the right direction. And uh, if nothing else, there is the Discord server. Um, they've got a lot of good information on there. I actually did end up setting up my machine basically to their parameters. I changed a few things again for my own setup, but um, their setup works in that document file that's on the Discord uh, server there. So I would use that for your setup. And short of that, uh, make sure you get your soft limits set up correctly. That's the only other uh, thing that I would tell you. Anyway, that's all I have to say for now. Uh, we'll be doing some other stuff in another video. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you all next time. In terms of calibrating the spindle, I uh, see I got some reflective tape on there. I have my digital tachometer here. I did find some Excel documents online where you could put in values and it would create the linearity.dat file for Mach 3. I couldn't get them to run because I'm using OpenOffice and that doesn't run the macros correctly, so I needed another way to sort of dial in my spindle because when I'd measure it it was pretty linear it just was running faster than it was than what I was inputting to Mach 3 so if I was running like you saw there for my test cuts 15,000 rpm I'd actually be running at like 15,500 or so at 18,000 rpm I was running 18,660 rpms so just a little bit too much so what I actually ended up doing is playing around. I'll try and show you on the screen here, as long as it's not flashing too much for you. What I found was is if I go into my spindle pulleys, I started increasing this number up from 24,000. And it would actually cause the, the signal voltage to change so that it would more closely represent what was actually being set. So at 24,400 as our max speed, if I, so I'm, I'm set at 12,000 here, so there should be five volts out. And if I run the spindle up, I don't know if I'll be able to do this so that you can see it. Twelve thousand RPM. So then if I go to fifteen thousand, we're getting fifteen thousand twenty four. If I go up to eighteen thousand. Eighteen thousand one twenty-five, and let's go up to twenty. Twenty thousand one seventy-seven. So, so that's close enough for me. 